Family, good morning. Uh, it's so nice to see all of you uh, here today. And Pastor Jonah, welcome. Um, friends, I'm just going to get into it. Pastor Honor, thank you for this opportunity and to all the elders of Rootsat Fellowship. I think many of you know me as the Sabwana guy. Uh, and if not the Sabwana guy, then the family and or city group guy. Uh, but today you get to see a different side of me, which is Wangani, the, the preacher. And it is all by God's grace. Um, so the topic for today is an encounter with Jesus. And my prayer is that as we go through the story, as we walk through the story, that you may have your own encounter with Jesus, whether you know Jesus or not. We'll be in John chapter 4, verse 1 until verse 18. Well, actually, it's longer than that, uh, but that's the part that I felt was important for us to read together. So I encourage you to open your Bible or your devices and to follow along with me as we depart from the station. Now, the Gospel of John has as its overall message that Jesus is the Son of God and that he came to this world to seek and to save those that are lost in order that they may believe that he is the Christ. And this is done through various signs, wonders, and the preaching of the word. This is done that you may believe in the gospel so that you may have eternal life. That is the main thrust of the gospel according to John. And where do I find this, you may ask? I find this from that very book, John chapter 20, verse 30 to 31. I'll read it for you for your edification. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, which is the book of John. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Friends, that is the key to unlocking the gospel, according to John. And so as you read any story in, the, in that gospel, this is the key that you need to use to unlock it. And indeed, that's the key that we'll use in the story today. So look out for those themes uh, that I've just mentioned, that I've just read uh, from John chapter 20. Now... The story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman is very popular. I'm sure many of you would have heard of it. Uh, you would have read it sometime in your life, maybe even heard it preached uh, to you. Uh, it's quite an amazing story in that it's one of those that pushed the agenda of the Gospel of John forward. It, it just contains so many truths about who Jesus is. Um, some people think that the main story, the main point rather, of this story is about evangelism that we need to be like Jesus in the way that we evangelize others and engage with people, right? Like Jesus was intentional around how he engaged the Samaritan woman. Now, as useful as that may be, that actually misses the point in this text. There's actually far better text to use if you want to talk about evangelism. You see, you and I are not Jesus in this story. We are the woman. We are not Jesus. We are in need of a savior. And that savior is Jesus Christ. Jesus stands alone and unique in that position of being a perfect savior. And we are in need of his salvation. In fact, if you want to talk about evangelism here, yeah, then the woman is actually a good example of what an evangelist is. Um, if you look at verse 28 to 29, it's part of the same narrative. We didn't read it because of time, but you can turn there. 28 says, so the woman left a water jar and went away into town and said to people, come. See a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? And later in verse 39, same narrative, many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all I ever did. So you see, the Samaritan woman had an encounter with Jesus. She realized her sin and need for a savior, and she accepted Jesus as that savior. And so armed with this newfound belief and good news, she tells everyone that she knows about Jesus. That's what an evangelist is. It is someone that has accepted Jesus as their savior and tells everyone about it because it is such great news of joy that it demands to be shared. It demands to be shared. And so our focus for today, friends, is not going to be on evangelism. It can't be. Before you and I can be evangelists, we first need to be awakened to the wonder of the gospel in Jesus Christ. I'll say that again. Before you and I can be evangelists, we first need to be awakened to the wonder of the gospel in Jesus Christ. And so that will be our focus for this morning. Now, the text is quite long, so I won't be able to cover every single general and specific teaching. I'll, I'll leave that to the family groups to delve in in detail. In fact, as I prepared the text, I initially wrote it as one sermon. Uh, then I quickly realized as I timed myself that it would take more than 90 minutes to go through absolutely every piece of material. It's really that rich and dense a piece of scripture. So for, day, I'll, for today, I'll try my best to cover all the specific lessons that are relevant to today's sermon topic. 
Now, the main thrust of this text is found in verse 13 and verse 14. And if you remember nothing else, this is what you ought to remember. Verse 13 to 14 says the following. If everyone who drinks this water, or rather, let me read that again. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. You see, this is the key to understanding this book. What does is, what is Jesus mean by living water? That which after you drink, you will never be thirsty again. That sounds like amazing water. That sounds like water you need to get. That sounds like water I need in my life. That is water that we all need here today. Um, I grew up in the late 90s and early 2000s. And I don't know if you remember, there was these Sprite ads uh, that used to have Kobe Bryant. Um, and uh, do, you guys, do you guys remember that? Uh, okay, so I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not the only one that, uh, that grew up in that era. Uh, and what was quite amazing is, um, you know, the tagline that they used. I don't know if you guys remember that tagline, which is, obey your thirst. That's quite beautiful. It got me to drink Sprite for many years. <laughs> uh, it was really amazing. I mean, Sprite still to this day, if you play sport, it's probably the drink that you would probably think about uh, if you go and you, you play some basketball or any other sport for that matter. So folks, Jesus this morning is saying he's got something better than Sprite. He's got something that quenches your thirst far better than Sprite or any other refreshing beverage. And I've heard many uh, in the story uh, when, we, when we had the question of the day that people were talking about. It's got something that is far more quenching than everything that we prefer to drink today. And so, folks, Jesus is gunning for our hearts. He's gunning for your heart. There's an invitation on the table and the invitation for us to drink of the living water that he offers so what's the problem, you might ask? Well, the problem is many of us don't know to ask this gift of God. We just don't know. We don't know to ask for this living water. We are being held back by our life, our anxieties, our struggles, our guilt, our shame, our sin, all of it. It's holding us back. But I hope that today we can, we can like the Samaritan woman, see that Jesus offers us living water and that there is forgiveness and grace for all we have done. And all we need to do is to accept the invitation to drink. Folks, we've got four points and four points only this morning. Uh, and if you are taking notes, this is the time to write down the sermon points. The first point that we'll see in the text is Jesus is a sovereign savior. The second point that we will see is we'll see the sovereign savior in action. The third thing that we'll see is the Samaritan woman's spiritual blindness and perhaps our own spiritual blindness this morning. And then lastly, how Jesus breaks through her spiritual blindness and perhaps for the first time, our own spiritual blindness this morning as well. So let's get straight into it. We have a lot to cover. The first point, Jesus is a sovereign savior. Verse one to verse three. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And right off the bat, let's first dismiss the reason that Jesus leaves for Galilee because of fear. That's simply not true. It simply wouldn't be consistent with the narrative of this book at all. In fact, in John chapter 3, verse 35, the chapter before, John the Baptist himself says, he's already declared that the Father has given all things to the Son. All things have been given to the Son. So Jesus isn't leaving because of fear of John or John's disciples or even the Pharisees. The reason is not fear. A possible reason could be that he didn't want to discredit the ministry of John the Baptist. Remember, John the Baptist came to herald the coming of the Messiah so he can decrease and the Messiah can increase. Another possibility is that Jesus did not want to discredit both ministries. Guys, you're part of the same crew. Why are you guys all fighting about who's baptizing more? And perhaps Jesus says, let me go to another region where I can continue to minister. Or maybe he wanted to avoid trouble with John's disciples. In chapter 3, verse 26, they've already come to John and complained that, hey, this man is baptizing more than you, and everyone is going to him. What's going to happen to us? Are we going to decrease? What's happening? And perhaps lastly, you know, he wanted to avoid trouble with the Pharisees because he knew the time for his persecution and suffering had not yet come. Right? Well, John doesn't give us a specific reason why Jesus had to leave, only the context behind the reason. So if the reason isn't fear, and the writer John isn't specific about what the actual reason is, then I believe that he's leading us to see a far deeper reason than first meets the eye. And let's see how John further develops the account in verse, in verse 4. 
Verse 4 says the following, and he had to pass through Samaria. He had to pass through Samaria. It's a very curious verse. It simply says that Jesus had to go and take the route through Samaria. Through Samaria. The King James says that Jesus needed to go through Samaria. The CSB says something very similar. So the question that we ought to ask ourselves this morning is, why does Jesus have to go through Samaria? Well, I believe there's at least three reasons um, that the writer John specifically writes verse 4. Two reasons are historical, which is uh, they are part of the context and would have been obvious to first century readers. And the last reason is expository, which is it is contained in the text itself if you continue on reading. So let's start with the two first historical reasons. Now, reason number one is geographical. Now, to give you some context, uh, there wasn't only one road to travel between Judea, which was on the southern side, and Galilee. There were actually multiple roads. And one could have taken, for instance, the road on the eastern side near the Jordan River. And devout Jews would often take this route to avoid defilement in Samaria, as you will see in a second. Even though they would have to cross the Jordan River at, during parts of that trip, they will still have to take that longer route just to avoid defilement in Samaria. There were other roads inland as well that you could take. They were a little bit longer, a little bit more treacherous, but you could possibly take them as well. If you look at the map of the region, this is Palestine in Jesus' time, on the southern side, you had Judea. On the northern side, you had Galilee, where Jesus was going to. And right in the middle, almost, almost on a straight line, was Samaria. And the little town called Sychar was part of that region. And so what is the shortest distance between two, uh, two, two uh, places? It's a straight line. And so perhaps, so perhaps Jesus wanted to save some time, right? Right? Well, the way that the writer John presents this makes us ask the question, is that really the reason? Is that really why Jesus wants to go through Samaria? And this leads us to our second historical context, which is the history between the Jews and the Samaritans. Now, here's another point that reinforces Jesus' mission and objective. The Jews and Samaritans had a long and terrible history together. The Jews, the Jews despised the Samaritans, and they considered them people not to be associated with. You see, after the Assyrians captured Samaria, which is the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel, in around 722 and 721 BC, they deported all the Israelites of substance and settled the land with foreigners who intermarried with the surviving Jews um, and adhered to some form of ancient religion. They corrupted their Jewish religion, and it became something that was different. You can read about this in 2 Kings chapter 17 to chapter 18. And after the exile of the southern kingdom, so they were separately exiled into Babylon, when those Jews started returning back to their homeland, they came back to see the Samaritans, who are now seen as racial half-breeds, children of political rebels, and people that were tainted, or whose religion was tainted by various unacceptable elements. They simply did not get along with the Samaritan people. To make matters worse, at around 400 BC, um, the Samaritans erected a rival temple at the base of Mount Gerizim. So if you look at Samaria and Sychar, almost on the south, south or southeast, does that make sense? So on the right here, if you look at a map, uh, there was a mountain peak that you could see called Mount Gerizim. And they erected a rival temple there where you would worship. And you would know as a Jewish person at that time, where is it that you worshiped? You worshiped in the temple in Jerusalem. That further fueled tension between the two groups. And although the temple, by the time this conversation takes place, had been uh, destroyed, that the, the temple in Mount Gerizim had been destroyed, they still continued to believe that that's where you went to worship. That further fueled the tension between the Jews and the Samaritans. And yet, friends, with all of this history, all of these divisions that are man-made between the Jews and the Samaritans, and Jesus still chooses to go through Samaria. You see what John is doing here. He's trying to tell us there's something far deeper, there's a far deeper reason than just distance, a far deeper reason than just divisions that he wants to go through Samaria. And this leads us to the reason number three, which is it was all part of Jesus' plan. It was all part of Jesus' plan. Look at verse 31 with me. Verse 31, if you just continue reading further down, verse 31, it says the following. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. So remember that he had sent away the disciples into town to buy some food. And now when they came back with the food, they're urging him, eat. It's a long journey. We're tired. You're tired. We still have a long way to go to get to Galilee. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. 
You see, friends, the reason is so much more than just a distance issue. The wider imperative and context of the book of John makes it clear that Jesus is consciously aware of fulfilling his father's plan. The gospel's premise is that Jesus has come from above with a defined plan to seek and to save that which is lost. Luke chapter 19, verse 10 says the following, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. So Jesus' whole endeavor here is divine appointment. His encounter with the woman, as chance event as it may seem to you, seem to you and I, was no mere chance event. It was divinely ordained. And truly, this is one of the amazing and wonderful facts about having a sovereign savior. You see, there are no geographical boundaries, no boundaries caused by racial divisions, no cultural boundaries, no boundaries caused by sin that can stop Jesus from getting to you. Jesus can get to you wherever you are, whomever you are, and whatever you have done. Jesus has the GPS coordinates to your heart. Turn to somebody next to you and say, Jesus has the GPS coordinates to your heart. And if you're here this morning, and maybe somebody invited you, uh, and perhaps you're here to see some, some of your family uh, members and a friend get baptized, you're not here by chance. You're not here by mere coincidence. Jesus has been carefully orchestrating things so you can be here today, so you can hear the gospel, and perhaps for the first time accept the gospel. That is why you are here. Jesus has been carefully orchestrating things so that you can have an encounter with him. So don't miss the opportunity, friends. Don't miss the opportunity to have your encounter with Jesus. Let's continue on to the second point, which is the sovereign savior in action as we continue to walk through the story. You see, the mission of Jesus is far superior and far more important than the divisions between the Jews and the Samaritans. It's far more important than the man-made divisions that we can create between ourselves. Far more important. Look at verse 4 again. He had to pass through Samaria, as we've seen. So he came to a town in verse 5 of Samaria called Sychar, near the field of Jacob that he had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Verse 4, we've spoken about this. He's intentional. He goes through Samaria and all the divine appointment that goes with that. Look at verse 8. He had asked his disciples to go buy food in town so he could be alone. In fact, commentators believe that this was a common thing that Jesus would do, to send his disciples away so he could have time alone to continue on with his father's plan. It doesn't specifically say that in the text, but the context makes it clear that most likely Jesus had asked them to go into town to buy some food. Here's another one that's for free. Presumably, the, the, the food that the disciples would buy, right, would have been tainted by Samaritan hands. But does Jesus, as we've seen, care about man-made divisions? No. His mission is much greater than man-made divisions. Look at verse 6. He sits down by the wall in broad daylight. Broad day, you can't miss him in the daylight. You cannot miss him. You couldn't miss him in the noon. Look at verse 7. He speaks to a Samaritan woman and even asks her for a drink from her bucket. Asks her from a drink from her bucket. And further, he speaks to her even though he knows she's an impure, adulterous woman. She's a woman of low standing in society. We know this from verse 16. In verse 16, we know that she had had five husbands. Five husbands, so possibly divorced five times. And the man she's with now is not her husband, but is in fact her boyfriend. You see what's happening here? And yet still Jesus converses with her and talks with her. Notice something else. She comes to the wall in the middle of the day. She comes to the wall in the middle of the day. Did you see that? She comes in the middle of the day. I, I grew up in, uh, in Limpopo, and I, and I think there's a few Limpopians here. Uh, people <laughs> that are from there know that it's very hot. Uh, the town that I come from is called Malamlele, uh, and it's even hotter, right? Like, it's very hot. Um, and, you know, during the worst time when we had a, cri a water crisis in that town, would have no running water for weeks on end, literally weeks on end. Uh, and I remember there was a time my dad bought a wheelbarrow uh, and if, you know, lots of buckets of water, or not full with water yet, but we had to go down the hill to go and fetch water right at the bottom because the pressure from the municipality wasn't strong enough right, to push the water all the way up the hill. You either had to get the water in the middle of the night when no one else is using water, and when it's really bad, you didn't get water for weeks. Right, so you had to take a wheelbarrow with your buckets and you go down the hill, much like this, down the hill, fetch the water, and then up the hill you had to go right, with your buckets of water. 
Um, yeah, that's not a happy memory, but I had a good childhood nonetheless. <laughs> Um, but if you had to ask my brothers um, what time of day they would go, they would never tell you in the middle of the day. Why? It's very hot. We had seen people collapse and literally die from sunstroke and dehydration in our time. You don't go in the middle of the day. You go either in the morning really early or you go later in the afternoon when it's cooled down again, right? You don't go in the middle of the day unless you had an ulterior motive, right? And this woman here had an ulterior motive. What was that motive? Well, I want to be alone. I want to make sure when I get to the wall, I don't meet with anybody. There's nobody there. In fact, most likely what, what would have happened is she was ridiculed and, ash and shamed by other women and maybe other people in society when she went to fetch the water because of her situation. So she figures in her mind, I'll go in a time when there's nobody. I'm not likely to meet anybody at all. I'm not likely to meet anybody at all. And though she thought her plan to avoid contact with people at the wall in the middle of the day was airtight. Jesus has other ideas. Jesus has other ideas. He has carefully positioned himself for his encounter with her. Do you see that? He has carefully positioned himself to have an encounter with her. And friends, this morning, Jesus is carefully positioning himself to have an encounter with you. If you don't know Jesus, he is available right here, right now by his spirit. He's available right here, right now, in the open, in the middle of the day, in this beautiful morning, and this beautiful garden. Don't miss the opportunity, friends. Don't miss the opportunity. Let's look at verse 9 as we continue to walk through the story. The woman is rightly shocked. She says to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. She tells Jesus that he is a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. What is going on here? Don't you know the rules? How can you ask me for a drink? In fact, verse 9b, that part that's in brackets, where it says, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans, can also be translated, Jews do not use dishes that Samaritans have used. See the man-made divisions again? She's saying, well, you know the rules, dude. You, you, you're not even supposed to use a bucket that I've used. What are you doing? Why are you asking me for the water? Why are you asking me for the water? But in verse 10, we start to see Jesus' real agenda. We start to see Jesus' real agenda with this conversation. It says the following, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. He would have given you living water. Now, the Old Testament is the background for this term living water. In fact, in Jeremiah, God is described as the fountain of living water. This is Jeremiah 2.13 and Jeremiah 17.13. Jeremiah 2.13 says the following. I'll read it for your edification. For my people have committed two evils. One, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. And two, hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Jeremiah 17.13 similarly says, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be put to shame. Those who turn away from you shall be written in the earth, for they have forsaken their Lord, the fountain of living water. So who is, who is the fountain of living water in the Old Testament? It's God. It is God himself. In fact, the Old Testament prophets looked forward to a time when living waters would flow from Jerusalem and bring renewal and life and restoration to the whole world. You can find this in Zechariah chapter 14. In fact, this is a call back to the Garden of Eden. Remember, the river that flowed from the garden, from God himself, watered the whole garden and continued on to the whole world to bring life and restoration and peace. It's also looking forward into Revelation, Revelation 22. What happens in new heaven and earth? In the center, there is the throne of God. And from the throne of God is the river of life. And that river flows out from God to his people and to the whole world and brings life, restoration, peace, and prosperity. That is what we are talking about. It speaks of his people having a saving knowledge of God and his grace, which provides cleansing, spiritual life, and the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. You can read about this in Ezekiel chapter 36, specifically verses 25 to 27, one of my favorite parts of scripture. You see, Jesus uses this woman's physical need for water in this arid and dry land, pretty much like Limpopo, right? Like where I come from, as an object lesson to teach her about her need for real inward spiritual transformation. So what Jesus is talking about here is the gift of eternal life. He's not talking about mere water, but living water. And this imagery is used elsewhere in the book of John in similar context. John chapter 6, verse 35 says the following, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will no, never go hungry, and he who comes to me will never be thirsty. 
John chapter 7, verse 37, it says, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. You see, friends, to receive this living water is to receive God himself in your life. Who is the fountain of living water in the Old Testament? It is God. And who is it that offers this living water here in this text? It is Jesus, the Son of God. Do you see that? To drink of this living water is to accept Jesus in your life with all the washing, the renewal, and transforming power of the Holy Spirit that it comes with, including the gift of eternal life. So I don't want you to go away and thinking, you know, like I have a metaphor, I must drink living water. How do I physically do this? It is about receiving Jesus in your life. It's about receiving God in your life. The woman picks up on something, right? In verse 11 to 12, she picks up on something. She says, are you greater than our father Jacob? Let me read verse 11 and 12 for you. She says to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. You see, she senses that Jesus is making some kind of claim to superiority by saying that he has this living water. So for her, she asks, what is the most logical question? You must remember the Samaritans and the Jewish people had a common lineage. They have a common lineage. It was only split in 722 BC with the exile of uh, the, the Northern Kingdom, that that lineage was split. But otherwise, they had a common lineage. They had common ancestors. And so their ancestor, who is Jacob in this, uh, in this, in this context, uh, is the same. He is common. And she asks, are you greater than our father Jacob, who built this well and drank from it himself? Now, the way that Jesus answers this is, is just quite beautiful. He again, uses the same language to further explain what he is saying. He says in verse 13, everyone who drinks the water from Jacob's well will be thirsty again. Everyone that drinks water from Jacob's well will be thirsty again. Look at verse 14. But whoever drinks the water that Jesus gives them will never thirst. They will never be thirsty again. You see how he answers the question. Jesus, uh, Jacob built the well, and the water that this gives only satisfies you for a moment. The water that Jesus gives, the living water, satisfies you forever. You will never be thirsty after drinking it. So Jesus is greater than Jacob. Jesus is greater than Jacob. We actually start to see Jesus' true identity here. In fact, I, I wrestled with an alternative title for this passage. It could, you could easily title it, Who is Jesus? It just contains so much truth about the identity of Jesus. This page, page is just oozing with evidence that Jesus is, is in fact the Messiah, the Christ that even Jacob was looking forward to. And why does the living water that he gives never make you thirst again? It is because the water he gives becomes a spring that wells up, uh, wells up to eternal life inside of you. In other words, the well that uh, he gives never dries up. It is ever full and quenches your thirst forever. This well, this water is the source of eternal life. It is the source of eternal life. I'm just going to move this because, you know, preaching with the screen, the sun gets very, very bright, and then you can't see anything. I'm just going to move it to a, sh to a shade. That's better. Let's move on to our third point, which is the, the, the Samaritan woman's spiritual blindness. Look at verse 15. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. The woman still doesn't get it. She's being offered eternal life, but she still does not get it. She wants living water, but she wants it to solve a very normal material problem. She's tired of having to come to the well to draw some water, and she, was, she figures, if I could get this living water, I would, not, I would not have to come to the well again and get ridiculed and shamed as I come and, you know, uh, fetch some water. What does that remind us, friends? Doesn't that remind us of us and the way that we sometimes treat Jesus? Jesus is offering us eternal life, a far greater gift. But often we treat Jesus as someone that is like a genie, right? Jesus, I need, I need, I need this, I need that, I need the next job, I need the big house, I need the, the nice car, the nice spouse, and all of that. And friends, I love prosperity. Trust me, I love me some prosperity. <laughs> but prosperity is not the greatest gift that Jesus gives us. It simply isn't. There's a far greater gift that Jesus is giving us. In fact, yeah, let me just go a little bit off track here. So a prosperity-led gospel can be problematic when we lead with prosperity and we forget what the gift that Jesus is giving is. 
we can end up in a space where we end up with everything we want, but no salvation of our souls. And we have to be very, very careful with that. I, I love prosperity, friends, but it is not the greatest gift that we are given. There is eternal life. There is, there is, there is the washing, there is the, the renewal, the spiritual life. And one day in heaven, we'll read, this, read about this in, in Ephesians, there is all the inheritance that is thought of for us in heaven in Jesus Christ. That is all coming. That is all coming. And sometimes we just settle for something that's so temporal, so, so temporary, right, uh, that we miss the ultimate gift. It reminds us of a similar story, right? The story of Jesus and Nicodemus in the previous chapter. Jesus is offering eternal life. And what is Nicodemus looking for? He's looking for a second womb, a physical womb that he can climb into and be born again. He misses it. It reminds us again of the prodigal son. What does the father give? The father gives life, protection. Uh, he, gives, uh, he gives every the love that comes from, from a father. And one day in the fullness of time and inheritance, but what does the son do? He wants to squander it right now. He doesn't want the greater gift. He wants whatever he wants right now, the things that only satisfy for a moment, and he goes away and he squanders it. You see, like the woman, we need to see that we need salva the salvation of our souls, but so often we settle uh, for the things that we face in the here and now. Settle for things that we face in the here and the now. Now let's move on to our last and final point, which is, how Jesus breaks through this spiritual depression. You see, he picks up on this, that she's not getting it, right? She's hearing the living water, but for her, it's about solving her issue of coming here and to fetch some water. I'll read again from verse 15. So give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw some water. And he told her, go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Now, the woman in verse 15 still does not understand what Jesus is talking about with this living water. She's thinking of something material and non-spiritual. So Jesus turns the discussion to something very awkward. It must have been very awkward for her. Jesus asked her to go and call her husband asked her to go and call her husband. Now, you must understand, when Jesus suddenly asks this question, it is not a haphazard thing. Jesus is not simply trying to wing it, right? He's not thinking, she, she doesn't get it. Let me try and throw her a curveball just to catch her off guard. This is actually a very carefully orchestrated and considered question. This curveball, as it were, that Jesus throws is meant to reveal to her her true spiritual condition and the need for this living water, her need for a savior. Uh, I told you about where I grew up. Uh, what I didn't tell you is, you know, when I was growing up, from around grade eight, standard six, grade eight, is that grade eight? Um, I got position one in every quarter of every term from grade eight to grade 12. That was me. You, 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 they love to hate me, but it was, it was what it was. <laughs> it is what it is. Um, you know, in fact, I remember by grade 11, I decided that I'm no longer competing with anybody in the school. Like, you know, like uh, it was just, you know, um, it, it, they were just all beneath me, you know, uh, they were all beneath me. In fact, I decided that I'm not even competing with anybody in the province, right? Like who would compete with me, right? Like all of Limpopo wasn't good enough. I was competing with the whole country and in fact, the whole world. That, that was my attitude. I literally thought that is what it is. Um, and fast forward to grade, uh, grade 12, and I, I grew up in church. I, I grew up in church. My, my parents sent me to church. My, my dad is a big guy, six foot four. I, I'm, I was scared of him. So he told me to go to church. So I went to church. Um, and we grew up in a Presbyterian church. I mean, I learned everything, catechism in my, in my mother tongue, right? Where do you get that? I learned all of that in my mother tongue. Apostles' Creed in my mother tongue, learned all of that. But it wasn't my faith. It wasn't my faith. It was really very far away from me. And I remember it was grade 12, um, and it was about the midterms, right? You know, you write your midterm exams. Uh, and I love mathematics, right? I really love that, uh, that subject. But there was also a school conference, I mean, a, a church conference, a youth conference that we had to go to. And it started on a Friday and ended on a Sunday. And I remember saying to myself, I will never go to this thing. I don't need it. What, what is the point of this church thing? What is the point of this youth thing? I mean, what are we going to do? Not, there's not even a real preacher there, right? We're all youth. We don't know what we're doing. So I'm not going to go to this thing. And that was probably the closest in my, in my heart that I'd come to shaking my fist at the heavens and saying, I don't need you, God. I don't need you, God. Anyway, fast forward to Sunday, literally two days later, the conference is now coming back. The youth 
uh, is coming back to church. And I skipped church because I'm like, oh, I didn't go. I don't want them to see that I didn't go to the conference. I'm going to skip it that Sunday, you know, because I just want to study. Right? I want to study for midterms. I'm going to be a scientist and I'm going to change the world that way. That's what matters to me. And that Sunday, my mother cooked a delicious meal. I mean, it was seven colors, everything, right? Like the works, like very similar to what many of you would have cooked for today in a Sunday like this. And for whatever reason, that particular Sunday, she decided to make the, the chicken a little bit spicy, just a little bit spicy, just a little bit spicy. And I had the most severe allergic reaction to that. I mean, like you would not believe it came out of nowhere. I ate it, I had seconds. And an hour later, I was complaining that I can't breathe. Fast forward an hour after that, I was in the doctor's room on the floor, stop breathing, and he's performing CPR on me. My mother is in tears, she's crying, hysterical. My dad is confused, wants to punch something on the wall. It's, it's just, it's all happening. And right at that moment, friends, it's, it's almost as if everything that I had heard and was preached to me my entire life all of a sudden made sense. And I knew, I knew I was dying. I mean, I was stopped breathing. I knew this is it, I'm, I'm dying. And it's as if I knew that I'm going straight to hell. I knew there was this place called hell and it's, it's got my name on it. It's got my name on it and that's exactly where I was going. I was terrified, I was, I was petrified. I don't look fondly at that uh, memory, but that's exactly what happened. You know, thankfully I didn't die. Um, you know, an hour later they decided, they stabilized me a little bit and they decided, look, this guy needs specialist care. And the closest place where I could get specialist care was in Pulukwane, in, in a medical clinic, a private care. And so my dad, I think he's, he's probably dri he's never driven faster than that before and after that in his life. Uh, it's two hours away. We got there in an hour. So I'll let you work out the math on that. Um, f fast forward, I was admitted for six days and I've never prayed as hard as I prayed at that time in my life. At that time in my life. A year later, I'm in varsity. Um, we go into a Bible study. It's led by a guy named Rob Walker. It leads the YMCA at UCT. Now it's Suput. And it's going through the Gospel of Mark. And I'm going with a friend of mine. And for whatever reason, I just heard the gospel clearly for the first time. And I went back to my, to my room, my dorm room, uh, my residence room. It's called College House. And I cried for probably an hour. And I gave my life to Jesus. And I gave my life to Jesus. You see, friends, this is what the gospel does. The gospel will make you come face to face with your sin and your guilt and shame. But the purpose is never to shame us, but for us to realize our sin, to confess it so that we can find forgiveness in Christ Jesus. That is the work of the gospel in the hearts of those that are bruised and battered by sin. And so if you're sitting here today and you're feeling convicted of your sin, it is a mercy. It is a mercy. You're not here by mere coincidence. What Jesus is doing, what the gospel is doing is he's revealing the dark parts of your life so that you can confront them and send it to the cross and say, Jesus, I don't know how to deal with this. I don't know how to deal with this. Will you take it away? Please, will you create me anew, create in me a new heart, O oh Lord. And so today, if you hear his voice where you're sitting, do not harden your hearts. If you're feeling convicted where you're sitting, do not harden your hearts. Let him in. Jesus is knocking at the door. He's sitting by the well and he's giving you an invitation. And that invitation is to drink. That invitation is to drink. And friends, we'll, we'll, we'll park the train here at this station as I call up the band. There's so much more to say, but I think you guys can read through that in your family groups. And so as the band comes up, I just want to say the following. If we confess our sins to Jesus and acknowledge, acknowledge our need for him as a savior, we will receive forgiveness, we'll receive eternal life, we'll receive the washing of regeneration that John chapter 3 speaks about. If we accept the invitation to drink this living water, we will receive eternal life. We will receive eternal life. And so friends, I don't know where you are this morning. I really don't know where you are. I've shared with you my life story. I'm sure many Christians here if you had to go speak to them, they will tell you of a similar life story, different context, dif dif different circumstances, but in the same way that Jesus impacts their lives. So if you don't know Jesus, the invitation is there. The invitation is for you to drink, to drink of this living water, to find forgiveness, to find restoration and new life in Jesus Christ, to find eternal life. And so please do not leave here without making that final decision. There will be people up here that will pray with you uh, should you be ready to make that call? Should you be ready to come up and accept Jesus into your life? He's, he's, he's waiting here in the open, waiting for you. And some of you here may be saying, well, I used to know him, but I've fallen away. I feel disconnected from him. I feel disconnected from my church, from my community, and even the mission of, of God. Well, I've got good news for you. This water is restorative. This water is restorative. It, it is good news for you too. Come and drink. 
Come and drink anew again so that you can be restored into the person that you're meant to be in God. Come and drink of this living water. And perhaps you're thinking, I'm a Christian. I've already drank of this living water. Well, again, I've got good news for you, figuratively and literally, right? The gospel is for everyone. It is for all of us. We are saved through the gospel and we are also sanctified through it too. We're empowered to do the mission and the work of God through the gospel. We don't graduate from it. We don't graduate from it. And so if you're a Christian here today, the invitation is for you too, to drink and drink deeply, to satisfy yourself in the living waters of God, to be filled with new life, with strength, with hope to carry on with his mission in this world. And it's in that way that you and I will be awakened to the wonder of the gospel in Jesus Christ and be empowered to carry on with his mission. Amen. Let me pray and end this segment. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for using me as a mouthpiece, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for speaking uh, to us, Lord, in this way and reminding us, Lord, that there is an invitation. And this invitation is open to all of us here today. If you can hear his voice today, do not harden your hearts. And so we pray, Lord, that you may call your people to yourself. Holy Spirit, I pray that you may do a supernatural work to call people to yourself. Restore what's been broken. Renew where strength is lacking. And bring people from darkness to light, perhaps for the first time. And so we thank you, Lord, for all of this. And we praise your name, Lord. We praise your name, um, you know, for this gospel. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.